So I'd like you to welcome you to our um, uni uh, social work open house. And um, for those of you who just came in, um, we're doing obviously an open house here on the Portland campus, but we're also live streaming it for folks who are out of state who are interested in the same information. So at some point, my colleagues here, um, Valerie Jones and Meg Webster, are going to be responding to um, to questions that may come in. So that's why they're looking at their computers. Um, so I'd like to welcome you to this morning's um, open house. And this is an opportunity <coughs> for you to um, get some uh, good information about our curriculum, about our field program, um, and also get um, an understanding of some of the parts of our program, um, such as uh, the advanced uh, trauma-informed uh, certificate that Arabella Perez is the coordinator of and we'll be talking about, and Pamela Smith, who is a foundation year student who is um, moving forward in getting the advanced um, uh, trauma-informed certificate. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to start off with um, Arabella and Pamela talking, uh, doing a presentation. Then we'll talk about the curriculum uh, and field the field education program and uh, talk about uh, opportunities you can have in terms of if you want to come and sit in on a class and get a you know, hands-on, feet on the ground, understanding about what our classes are like, what faculty are like, and a good opportunity to kind of ask as many questions as you want or have. Um, so I'm going to stop now and uh, turn it over to Arabella and uh, Pamela. Hi, everybody. Hi. Great to see you all here. Yes, and a Saturday morning <laughs> when I usually like to sleep in unless the dog wakes me up. Uh, so I would just love to just uh, first, before I tell you who I am and Pam introduce herself, I just want to hear who you are um, and, and just sort of kind of get a sense of, you know, I don't know, what's attracting you to, to social work. So anybody want to start first? Okay. Yeah. Um, so my name is Leah. I just graduated with um, my bachelor's degree in community health education. Um, and I am planning to go get my master's in either um, social work or school counseling. So I'm here to just kind of learn more about it and write out my options, I guess. Thank you, Leah. Uh, I'm Chad. I also just graduated from UMF with community health education degree. And I, like Leah, am like exploring different options in graduate programs. Great. I'm Nancy. I currently go to USM. Um, I actually like being in the community and helping, and I want to work with youth. So this would be great. Just to learn about it. The right place. Yeah. I'm Lauren, and I graduated three years ago um, with a BA in criminal justice. So I've kind of done a bunch of different things since then. Still, always coming back to you and me. I probably visited. I think when I first graduated, I came to visit, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do yet. So I got some nice experience, and I'm back, and I'm very happy to join. <laughs> Hi, my name is Patrick. Um, graduated from University of Maine Machias with a recreational management degree eight years ago. Um, since then, I've been doing a lot of uh, guiding and um, wilderness therapy, horticultural therapy, and uh, that really got me into um, just more of the therapeutic side of that business and really interested in just kind of being a therapist or more. Professional, kind of taking my career. Oh, you would love one of our students, Caleb. Is Caleb coming today? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so Caleb is a wilderness guard. What's Caleb's background? Anyway, he, yeah, you would love Caleb. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. My name is John. Uh, I'm late. <laughs> <laughs> I graduated with a philosophy degree 20 years ago and uh, ended up with five children and a business. I owned a business, and uh, in facing the Sort of, I need to. As about a year ago, I decided to uh, try to answer questions about how my life uh, behaved differently than I expected. And in doing so, I decided to change my career and um, learn lessons from the past 20 years that that taught me to refocus on helping people. And at this point in my life, with with the pressures that are involved and the realities that are involved, the best way to do that is to uh, investigate and becoming an MSW. So that's why I'm here. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. 
Well, thank you all. So we got some wonderful experience here in the room and interest in the room as well, and that's fabulous. Um, so I'm Arabella Perez, and the slide has my name up there. Uh, and I've been a social worker now for coming up on 25 years. Um, so I never did a career change, although even within my career as a social worker, I've done at least five different things. So I really started out uh, focusing on community um, engagement strategies, working with uh, populations in New Orleans that were HIV positive, really adolescents. This is before the cocktail of drugs that gets people to sort of live with the disease. Uh, it, it didn't exist, so many of the clients I was working with actually succumbed to the disease, and that was very challenging working in housing projects with, with this population, getting the health healthcare that they needed and the resources they needed. With that, moved here, became a therapist, then ran a program, then started my own nonprofit organization, worked with juvenile justice for a good seven years, running a major grant. Um, now I'm here at the University of New England. For the past 12 years, my focus has really been exclusively on trauma, and we'll talk about why that is when I get into the slides. Uh, and the, the other thing that I do in addition to that is I do a lot of consulting nationally for the federal government. So, so Pam and I were talking, Pam said, Carbella, whenever you go, tell me she wants to come along with me. And I am ready to pass the baton on because it's, it's a lot of work. So I, I love um, having come here two years ago to create the certificate to really pass on that knowledge to others who, who can do that work because one day I do want to retire, hopefully to a warm climate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not from here. <laughs> I'm definitely from away. Um, so, um, so that's who I am, and I'm going to let Pam talk about who she is. Good morning, I'm Pamela Smith, and I am a Southerner, so you might have to go this, stop talking, stop talking, because we love to talk. That's my favorite, <laughs> very hospitable. But my journey to coming to UNE began, I'm a, a retiree from the United States Army, and I feel like I got my unofficial training in social work through that. I was uh, able to see firsthand trauma victims, uh, went through some trauma myself, and through the Kuwait and Iraqi wars. And so um, I really have a passion for people who are dealing with trauma or suffering from trauma. And so short feel, I, I love it because I think they deal directly with, they're starting to really get engaged in that, you know, helping people to tell their narrative, finding treatments that help people overcome that trauma. So I also, Nancy, am an alumni at the USM. <laughs> I went there through the theater department in which I, uh, my long-term goal is to open my own nonprofit, dealing with trauma patients of all nationalities, ages, I want them all, I love it. <laughs> so I, and while at USM, one of the professors <coughs> here, Lori, she, Lori Powers, yes, she uh, came to talk about the two certificates, mm -hmm. which that's another program here. And I was so infatuated from her presentation that I came to, just like you guys, to, to come find out more information. And I sat through one of the open houses, and I heard the trauma-informed pitch from Arabella. <laughs> exactly. And I have been just so, just, I knew that that was it for me. I knew I wanted to go, and that's where my passion is, and my goal is to become uh, more educated in that field and uh, specialize in trauma. I think that um, I'm in advance uh, course now, so we'll be talking about that, and I'm going to have Pam talk a little more about her experience with the courses and with her trauma from change project. So I'm glad that um, Pamela got to present with me. And and one of the principles of trauma informed care is is really the importance <coughs> of. Um, always connecting with individuals who are consumers, have lived experience, clients, students, so that it's not just me providing you with information, but you actually get to hear from other people who have some direct hand knowledge. So I'm thrilled that Pam is here. I'm also, you know, and, and Pam shared some personal stuff with you as well that really relates to why she's doing the work and how she's going to connect that to the work in the future. So that's part of being trauma informed. So that's who we are. Um, who's heard of adverse childhood experiences? Wow, okay. Now that that's a bad thing, I'm just like, wow, because I love talking about it and I don't have enough time to talk about it because I actually teach an entire course on it. Uh, but what I am going to do is just give you some nuggets to really get you thinking about why it is that we need to really be thinking about adverse childhood experiences and all the work that we do because it is a health crisis. Um, so, I had an epiphany. Okay. So, 
So essentially, this was me on the wheel when I first started my, my education 25 years ago. So I went to Tulane University in New Orleans in the South. Love the Southerners, love the hosp hospitality there. Um, I am a Cuban and Puerto Rican. Uh, so I was raised uh, only speaking Spanish, and I became an English language learner at the age of five watching television. So it was things like the Partridge family and the Brady Bunch. Um, I thought that I would grow up and, and marry somebody, and he'd have three boys, and I'd have three girls all with blonde hair. I don't know how that was going to happen. But <laughs> uh, and my husband's not blonde. Um, but anyway, um, when I graduated from Tulane, I look back on it now, we never talked about trauma. We never really talked about trauma. We may have, but not in any intentional way. So here I am going through a clinical program um, and not having addressed the underlying cause of a lot of issues for, for children, families, adults, which is trauma. So here I am graduating from a program, and one of the things I'm doing is I'm working at a homeless shelter called Covenant House in New Orleans, and I'm working with kids who've been trafficked, sex trafficked. Um, that are homeless, that have been sexually and physically abused, that are that are throwaway kids, not runaways, throwaways. Okay, they're just no one's interested in, in hanging on to these kids. They're living on the street, they have nowhere to turn. And what do they all have in common? Trauma. Did we talk about it? Not really. Not really. Why? Probably a variety of reasons. Oftentimes we're just afraid to ask about it. We're uncomfortable. We don't know how to. We haven't received the proper training. And if we do find out about trauma, we're too overwhelmed and we don't know what to do with that information. Who do we refer to? How do we treat? What does that mean? Instead, we just focus on the behavior and trying to keep them safe. Um, so, so throughout my career, the focus has always been working with, with children and families, um, again, who really were, were thrown away by society, by their families. And when I, when I think about that work, um, I really think I was doing the best I could. I really, it was, it was do no harm, okay? I was always doing no harm. Then I became exposed to trauma-informed um, theory. And Roger Fallot and Maxine Harris wrote an amazing book that I use in my course called Using Trauma Theory to Design Service Systems. Uh, and there's another individual, Dr. Sandra Bloom, who used her book, which is Saint the Sanctuary Model. Um, so we had these pioneers who were coming forward who were recognizing, because of their own work in residential care and homeless shelters, recognizing the importance of uh, really addressing trauma. Welcome. Come on in. Yeah, come on in. Hello. And I met you already, right? Welcome again. Okay. Um, so, um, so once I became exposed to that material and I got to hear Roger Fallot, he came to me and spoke, um, I was at the time the, the manager of a program at a, at a large agency here in Maine, and I was asked to think about how to incorporate his work within the child unit that I ran. And at the time, I thought to myself, this is just common sense. Why, why would I be talking about trauma informed? We already do this as social workers. And thankfully, the executive director at that time, who's now a dear friend of mine, was like, give it a try. So we, we were awarded, a, uh, the state of Maine was awarded a major federal grant, and I ended up becoming the director for that grant. And, and all the time I was skeptical, because I'm thinking to myself, what's this trauma-informed stuff? What is this about? I, 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 you know, we already do this. Um, and, and the more I became involved in the work and understood the concepts, and we're going to get to those, the more I realized I actually did do harm. Not all the time, and never intentional. But there were times that I did more harm than help. And why? Because I really wasn't asking about the trauma. I was putting a band-aid on an issue and thinning them back out into the community, when in fact I wasn't addressing the fact that there was a grave wound there that I really needed to address and putting a band-aid on it wasn't going to do it. And I was just like the system. All of the systems were doing it at that time. So whether we're thinking about child protective services, juvenile justice, mental health, even the educational system, you know, often it's let's put a band-aid on it and just address what's happening on the surface, which are the behaviors. Okay. Let's not really talk about the gorilla that's in the room, which is the trauma. Um, so that's what I'm here to talk to you about. So that was my epiphany. And once I had that epiphany, I just sat and I was like, I can't keep doing this. I can't keep going through this, you know, this, this sort of little hamster wheel here and keep doing the same thing over and over again and getting the same outcomes. <coughs> so what are adverse childhood experiences? Um, so there's 10 of them. And this came out of... Um, a study that was conducted at Kaiser Permanente uh, by Dr. Vincent Felitti. Dr. Vincent Felitti is a medical doctor, not a psychiatrist, not a psychologist, just a, a, a plain old medical doctor. And there's nothing really plain about him, but just, I mean, just so you get it, plain old medical doctor, okay? 
Um, and he was running a, a clinic working with individuals who were clinically morbidly obese and needed to lose weight because of what was happening to their health. So we're talking about, um, we're talking about um, diabetes management. And so he created this treatment that really was wrapping services around the patients, really looking at them holistically. Um, and he was doing a great job, and they lost weight, they lost significant weight. Because it was a research study, he had to go back to find out how his patients were doing, so they would come in to be interviewed by him or his staff. And six months later, what do you think happened to these patients? Yeah, many of them gained weight back. Some actually gained more than their original weight. Okay? So Dr. Felitti, by nature, is a really curious guy. I had the pleasure of driving around the state of Maine, so I really got to, to get into his psyche. So he is, to me, a, like a grandfatherly type who just wants to know about you. Like, he'll just ask you questions in such an engaging way. It's that Southern hospitality, even though he's not a Southerner. Uh, where you just find yourself sharing things. So he had engaged, he, he had he developed these trusting relations with his patients where they began to share information with them. He wasn't asking these questions, but they were sharing with him about abuse that they had experienced prior to the age of 18. And he really, and as he was listening, he was noticing a pattern. And he sort of paused and he's like, wow, there's something else going on here. It's not just that they're having difficulty managing their food intake, but there's more going on. And they seem to all have this in common. So he found these were the top 10 uh, incidents that were reported by his patients. What's also interesting is this is Kaiser Permanente. So these patients all had private insurance. They were middle class to upper middle class. So not the clients I was working with in New Orleans and, and in Miami and in Newark and in DC. Um, so as you look at these, emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, witnessing domestic violence, alcohol, drug abuse, mental illness, parents separated, divorce, incarcerated household member, emotional neglect, physical neglect. Can you think of some folks that have some of these ACEs? Yeah, absolutely. And when we think of that then, what he was able to then do <coughs> is the following, is um, create this, book, the, this pyramid, which is sort of the, the standard when we talk about ACEs, where you have your foundation here of those ACEs, and then as you go up, we begin to see, he, Dr. Felitti begins to see what's been happening with, with his patients. Um, so if they have three or more of these, because that's what the study eventually discovered, is that if you have three or more of these, you begin to sort of go up this, this pyramid. Um, so you have social, emotional, and cognitive impairment. So again, when you think about some of the people that, that we're working with or that you will be working with, you know, some examples of what those impairments may be, when we think about the social impairments, difficulty with relationships and how that impacts you socially. When you think about emotional, what are some of the emotions that, they, that you might see? Anybody want to share? And Pam, you can help out. What are some of the emotions? Emotions oh, positive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also be that. Yeah. What else? Anxious. Anger. 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 Yep. Just the feelings. Anger. Sadness, yeah, they could be elated, yeah. I mean, it, 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 um, so you're gonna have some emotions here. And then you're gonna have some cognitive impairment. So again, I think about kids, especially in school, okay? What we end up seeing is that for many of these kiddos that end up diagnosed with some sort of learning disability, um, some sort of cognitive impairment, what may be, I'm not gonna say this is true for all, but what may be happening for many of these kiddos is that they have some adverse experience here that are impacting their brain development. And we talk about that in advanced trauma. We talk about how the trauma impacts brain development. And we talk about periods, what we call plasticity, when the brain is at its best to be wired. And when we think about when is it best to be wired, it's really those, those elementary school age years. And then you think about, and now we're adding trauma to that. So what's happening to that developing brain? Uh, that's pretty frightening. Um, hence cognitive impairments. And then as we go up, we then think about, okay, so now I've been impacted by trauma, I have to find a way to cope with that. So I might develop some health risk behaviors. So an example of a health risk behavior might be what? Overeating. Overeating could be a health risk behavior, or undereating, just the way we manage food intake, that could be a health risk behavior, okay? Substance abuse, yes. 
for Dr. Politi's study, it happened in the early 1990s, smoking. He found almost all of his patients were smokers, okay, significant smokers, like pack-a-day smokers, okay? Um, so these are some of the health risk behaviors that happen. Um, unprotected sex, okay? Um, so these are health risk behaviors. Those health risk behaviors then lead to disease, disability, and social problems. So what are some of the diseases associated with what you just described? High blood pressure. High blood pressure, yes. Diabetes. Diabetes, Diabetes. yep. High cholesterol, okay. Cancer, right? So these are some of the diseases we begin to see. What about the disability? So I heard anxious. So anxiety as a diagnosis might be one of the labels that will be assigned to you if you have these ACEs, okay? Um, some other disabilities, it could be those, those learning disabilities that I mentioned earlier, okay? Uh, working with juvenile justice, a lot of kids, oppositional defiant kind of disorder, okay? When in fact, what they really are presenting are those adverse childhood experiences and they're suffering from trauma, okay? Um, in the school system, we see a lot of attention deficit hyperactivity, so mm -hmm. that becomes a disability. Um, so we have these disabilities. Then we have social problems. So when we think about those social problems, those social problems could be in order to sustain that substance use habit, you know, I have to engage in some behavior that may get me involved with the criminal justice system, okay? Um, or I might be um, gambling, okay? So I'm gonna lose my home. I might end up losing a loved one because of, because of my uh, gambling. Um, other social problems, if I'm being trafficked, uh, or if, um, uh, well not if, but if I'm being trafficked, I'm out there on the street, again, being involved with the, with the criminal justice system. So that becomes a social, and we have lots of social problems. All we have to do is look at our prison system and see that many of those social problems that are there are related to the adverse childhood experiences. Okay? Uh, and then finally, we have early death. So even here in Maine, this is um, true. Um, so a study happened at an uh, Indian Township with their health center there, and they were looking at women who lived on reservation, not off reservation, but on that reservation. So this is here in Maine. These are our native people. So what do we know about our native people? What were some of the adverse experiences that, that, were, that they suffered? Anybody? Just thinking about Native Americans in general. What do we know about their history? Alcohol abuse, mm -hmm. substance abuse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And why the substance abuse? Why the alcohol abuse? Why the domestic violence? Because their land was taken from them. They were told not to speak their language. They were forcibly removed from their homes and placed in foster care. Okay. So they really disrupted the family system. Okay. And then in advanced trauma, we talk about epigenetics. We actually talk about how uh, how how we have trauma residue in our DNA. So. Um, this might be a seven-year-old child who's born on reservation who never experienced that, but that trauma residue is there for them because their parent experienced it and their grandparent experienced it and got passed on. Um, and this is where the science is amazing, you know, because I think we've always known that anecdotally and now we actually have science that backs it up. Um, so so on, on, on the reservation for the women, all those things are happening and what we also see is high rates of diabetes, of hypertension, of cancer. So my question to you is, and you can just guess if you don't know, because most people don't know it, but we think about the, you know, the average lifespan, <coughs> it's generally 80s for women, a little less for men. What do you think it is for women who live on the reservation? Any guesses? 70. 60. 50, 50, 50, 55. 55? Any other guesses? 65. It's 47, I believe, 46 or 47. Yep. Isn't that amazing? It's an, yeah, absolutely. So, um, so if you were to go to a web, there's a website that the Centers for Disease Control manages on average childhood experiences. The study's still going on. Many states still participate. Um, and what they're finding is, if you have seven adverse experiences, 20 years are shaved off your life. 20 years, which would mean 60. Okay, if you're living on reservation and a female, it's even less than that. And they generally experience. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. So, so that's the reason why it gave me pause as that sort of non-trauma informed therapist, you know, before mm -hmm. I was exposed to this material. Once I saw this, I, I was like, 
oh my gosh, I mean, I really am putting a band-aid on this because that new person going back into the community and this is still being untreated, it's not being talked about, it's not being recognized, um, and they will likely develop the impairments that we've just sort of reviewed, which will then lead to an early death. Okay. And these are just some stats for you about uh, what, what, what Dr. Felitti's study indicated, which is that they're twice as likely to smoke, seven times as likely to be alcoholics, twice as likely to have cancer or heart disease, 12 times more likely to attempt a suicide, uh, and men with six or more AIDS were 46 mm -hmm. times more likely to have injected drugs in men with no history. And there's a lot more of these facts, but these are just a few of them. So, it is the number one health epidemic in the United States. Trauma. It is the number one. Which is why, again, I look back on my education as a social worker and I think to myself, wow, we never talked about this as the number one health epidemic. But in all fairness to, to, to my alma mater, Dr. Foley's research was just starting when I graduated. I graduated in 1993 and his research was starting in 1993. Um, so with this responsibility, with this information comes a responsibility to use it, hence my certificate, or the certificate. Um, so what does being a trauma-informed therapist mean? And this is where Pam and I are gonna sort of talk together. Um, it means that we want to recognize that people have been impacted by trauma until proven otherwise. Okay. Um, we wanna always remember resiliency and hope that we as humans have a tremendous capacity to bounce back and to be resilient and that we as social workers need to always hold hope even when our client can't hold hope for whatever reason. We have to be the ones holding the hope and to find a way to transmit that. And then the trauma-informed question becomes what happened to you, not what is wrong with you. Again, that's not something that I was taught. So when I reframe the question to what happened to you instead of not what is wrong with you, it really allows for uh, a relationship to be built that doesn't feel judgmental doesn't feel shaming and blaming, that really wants to get at your story. I want to hear your story, because clearly your story has shaped you, for better or for worse, it has shaped you. So what's your story? The beauty about trauma-informed is that it's not just about the people that we're serving, it's also about me and you, it's about the organizations we work in, it's about the university you choose to attend. It's really recognizing that all of us are part of this fabric this web, and that we all had our own story about what brings us to this work, um, what activates us as we're doing this work. So we're constantly asking each other the, the what happened piece as opposed to what's wrong, and finding ways to work collaboratively together, which then gets to this. So these are, so using ACEs, because ACEs really is just the foundation. What do we do once we have this information? Because we're not just going to be talking about ACEs over and over again. Now we actually want to do something. It's our call to action. And this is where the trauma-informed theory comes out, which is that we recognize these are the, the principles that we need to see um, operationalized within an organization. And, and, and what I want to say is here at the School of Social Work. So these principles here, as you look at them, some of them might, might look like, okay, I think I know what safety means, or I think I have an idea of empowerment. Others, you might be like, peer support, not quite sure what that is. Um, and this is where the trauma-informed certificate comes in, where we spend an entire semester unpacking this and talking about this. And then the following semester, we do advanced trauma. We actually then get into what are some of those evidence-based, community-informed treatments that are out there, and how do I go about learning them so that I can apply them to my work with children, families, adults. And, and within that, we talk about all the systems. We talk about trauma-informed schools, we talk about trauma-informed juvenile justice, trauma-informed child welfare. Uh, trauma-informed prison systems. We really uh, try our best to address every imaginable um, organization that, that a consumer, that a constituent might enter. Okay, so what are these principles? So the first one is safety, okay? So the first one is safety, which means it's more about physical safety. It's also about emotional and psychological and emotional safety. So for a client, we often, and I use the example of somebody who's a domestic violence uh, a situation, who's left that and now is in a shelter. We assume that they're safe, right? Because they're away from whoever's been harming them, right? And we assume that because they're there now, they're physically safe. What we need to ask ourselves, though, are they emotionally safe? Are they psychologically safe? Are they spiritually safe? What, what does that look like for that individual? And that may vary from person to person. But, but often, the traditional social worker sort of stops at, well, they're physically safe. We got them out of the environment. 
without thinking about all the other pieces. And again, many studies show that just because you remove somebody from the environment doesn't mean that they feel safe. It doesn't mean that, that their system isn't still on fire or offline, okay? So how do we, how do we ensure that? Um, from a UNE perspective, I want to hear from Pam a little bit when she thinks about safety, um, because it's, again, it's not just about the, the constituent, the consumer, but it's also about uh, being a student here. And I'm wondering, do you want to share anything, Pam? Yeah, as a student, especially when I first came here, for me, um, I hadn't been in school for a while and knew nothing, of, did not have a, a social work background. So safety for me was, okay, can I trust coming here, talking to the, to the professors? Can I trust the environment here as far as, okay, am I gonna be uh, judged or, you know, is it safe? Mentally for me was the big thing, you know, here, am I gonna have support here that I need to get through this program? And so safety, when I came here, the first thing um, that they talked to you about here, I met uh, Amy, which, felt like my safety net for me. She just talked to me about, you know, it's okay to be you. It's okay to just come here and sit and you don't have to jump into anything. You you pick where you want to go first, just sit, you know, and I'm not gonna get into George yet, but safety to me was knowing that I could come here and just have that person or that environment, which on the fourth floor, if you have an opportunity to go up there, I mean, they even have a sign that says safety zone up there, you know. So to me, it was that as a student. Yeah, thank you, Pam. Yeah, and when I think about, you know, what students often say, too, is that, that being safe, again, it's not just about being physically safe, but it's knowing that, you know, I just had an interaction with someone <coughs> and I'm feeling a little unsure about who do I go to and knowing that there's somebody up on the fourth floor that you can go to. Uh, if you're in field placement, and I know Amy's going to talk, be talking about a seminar, but to me, a seminar is an example of creating a safe space in which you can really talk about your field experience um, so that you can get the feedback and support that you need uh, in order to continue to feel you know, emotionally and psychologically and mentally safe. So these are examples that have been in university, you know, what does safety look like? Because we want to make sure that you feel safe. And when we talk about that, we talk about all those aspects of safety. Okay? Um, the next one is, is trustworthiness and tra transparency, and I think that, that Pam was all, and what I love about the principles is they all fit in, it's like a puzzle, they all fit in. So taking one away sort of compromises the web. Um, but when we think about trustworthiness and transparency, again, what's interesting is when I first started doing my work, and I heard this, I did a, I did a training once and I was in DC, and there was a gentleman in the front row who like was scowling the entire time, and I thought, oh, he's hating everything I'm saying. He totally is not getting comment from. Because I found that my hardest audience were generally clinicians. My, anybody else totally was like, I get it, Arabella. Like if there were educators in the audience, if there were correction officers in the audience, shelter workers, but it was clinicians that got really resistant because I was one of them. I mean, I was resistant because I thought, I'm already doing this. What do you mean I have to be trying to find? Of course I am. Of course I would never harm my client. Anyway, he's scowling at me. And, I'm thinking, and of course at the end we ask for questions and he raises his hands and oh, okay, here it comes. And he just said, I've been, and he's a psychologist, so I've been sitting here, I've been listening to you, and I realized that <coughs> I assumed that my patients trusted me because I'm a trained psychologist. I assumed, and I should never have assumed. And I thought, wow, he got it, he got it. So with trust, you know, as a professor, I'm never gonna assume that, that you're coming to my class and that you trust me. I have to gain your trust. And the way that I gain your trust is I'm really clear around expectations. I'm clear about how to reach, reach out to me. I'm clear at following through with that. I always say to my students, you know, I will respond to you within 48 hours. If not, something's probably happening. Come, come fetch somebody to find me, you know? But, but, I, but in order to establish trust, and I do the same thing with, with a patient, with a client, with a constituent, is I'm really clear about what it is I'm gonna do and how I'm gonna do it, and I follow through on that. That's how we develop trust. And that's how we're transparent as well. So Pam, do you want to share your experience with that? I do. I want to say that uh, the MSW program here, I'm, I'm sticking to that because that's what we're in here for. They really prove that through the handbook. Just please read the handbook. Um, take time to read it because what's in there, they really do honor that. And also with our director head, um, Shelly, she has an open door policy and it's in the handbook. but. You can really go in, and she's so transparent, all the faculty here, I feel like the students as well, what they say, 
as of this point, I have they have not proven to be liars. They <clears throat> honor what they say. Okay, if they say, okay, you can come to me if you're struggling with this, or if you don't have, uh, if you don't understand the curriculum, or if you won't, you even want to need to sit down and go through the curriculum. I'll make time for you, office hours here. So uh, they gain. I found them to be very trustworthy people, and they they do what they say. So thank you for that. I'm glad that you have your experience. Peer support, this is an exciting one. And I think the School of Social, um, the Student Organization is an example of that. So I'm going to let you talk about peer support. Exactly. I think I talked to you a little bit about Caleb uh, a little earlier. He is the president of the, for the student body at the MSW. So peer support, he leads the way in that. And you'll have an opportunity to meet him because he makes himself readily available to everyone. But here at the school, from the first day one, um, the advanced year students, they reached out, they came back, hey, if you need me, come and get me. But what happens in your classroom as you begin to develop that trust with your peers, you'll find that you can text, call, reach out, especially when you get to research classes or even in your field placements. We are cross-networking through <coughs> class projects. The peer support here is wonderful. You have a background of different people. You have single parents, single people, veterans. So you have a, a, a diverse group of peers here that you can reach into and tap into the resources when you need that support. So, so peer support is really recognizing that we always want to, at, at the hub of the work we do, hear the voice. If it's in a mental health organization, we want to hear the voice of the consumer. We want them to be able to offer that peer-to-peer -peer connection. Here at the university, it's looking at current students as well as alums. Mm -hmm. and, and we have we have an alumni organization, and I'm sure Pam's going to join that uh, when she graduates, that's really there for networking opportunities. So thinking about opportunities in the future for employment, people to connect to, to get some support. Like, I just have this experience, and I want to talk to a fellow alum who's, who works in, the, in a similar field. Um, so it's all that networking. Um, then there's collaboration and mutuality. Um, so, so again, this is the importance, and I think Pam's already given an example. This is about collaborating. So when, when you get to, to designing your, your, your schedule, meeting with your advisor, uh, and it's not about me telling Pam, and I, she's my advisee, by the way, Pam, you must take these courses. In fact, in fact, Pam sort of shared that her interest was in the arts and social justice. My intent was never to say to her, don't do that, do my certificate. No, it really was to listen to her needs, have her come in and have her talk about what she wanted and then provide her with options, you know? That to me is collaboration, um, so that it's not me telling her what she has to do. And when, when Amy talks about field placement, the same thing. You know, we don't tell you where you have to go. You know, it's a collaborative process. And we pride ourselves here at the Union with that. Um, empowerment, voice, and choice. We always want to hear your voice. Always want to hear your voice. You have many opportunities to express your voice if you want to. Because we also recognize that some folks may not want to be front and center. I'm thrilled that Pamela is willing to be front and center here because I want to hear her voice. I want to get feedback from students. Um, based on that feedback, I've actually tweaked uh, the trauma informed certificate, so it's always about voice. Um, I'd like to chime yeah. in on the empowerment, voice, and choice part. Um, that was particularly uh, important to me to have a choice. And in my field placement, that was, uh, I, would, I will expand on that later, but it, deal, it ties in nicely with my trauma informed project, which we'll talk about here to be able to pick a, a placement where I felt that I could be effective as a part as a team member there. And I had an opportunity to really uh, advocate for a field placement that I wanted and was heard and actually it came out. Okay, we never uh, and the last one here, um, and I'm actually gonna put in a plug for a course that we're developing. So cultural, historical, and gender issues um, so for those of you that live in the area, you know that we are a diverse community when it comes to our refugee population. Uh, and much of the work that I did, I first actually did most of my work in the Lewiston area before bringing my nonprofit down here to the Westbrook Portland area. And I employed cultural workers from Somali, Somali Bantu um, uh, communities uh, working with our refugee population here. Um, we now have a grant, a land grant, and we are working with members of the refugee community to co-create a course that will be offered in the spring of, uh, of 2018. Um, and, and the course is it's called, I've taken Meg so far, Empowering Cultural Education. It's really about working with diverse communities from a social work perspective. Um, and we're gonna be talking about the legal aspects around 
um, immigration, uh, the terms, how to, how to sort of understand it. Granted, it's constantly shifting, so that'll be a challenge each semester as we sort of look at that. We're bringing in speakers to actually talk about that. So Roshu leads the Immigration Legal Advocacy Project will be coming in to talk about that and lead that class. And then each week we sort of unpack another group. So we start by talking about the groups that historically have been oppressed. We talk about the African American community. We talk about the Native American community. We talk about the Latino community. And then we go into our most recent refugee and immigrants. So we're talking about the African community, the Arab community, uh, Pacific Islanders. <laughs> And we're, we'll be bring in cultural brokers and leaders to come in and talk about that. Um, I did an all-day training Thursday with one of our alums, Regina Phillips, who used to be the coordinator of the Office of, of uh, Multicultural Affairs, here, or Refugee Services here for the city of Portland. And we had a panel of six women who represented five different countries. And it was amazing, absolutely amazing to listen to them say firsthand, these are engagement strategies that you should consider. You know, this is, this is the best way to, to interact with my community. Um, so knowing that um, many of our students have said, I need more skills working with this, this emerging population, what can you do about that? Um, and then um, having the flexibility when I came here to have a director say, Arabella, go right ahead. Yeah, develop it, develop it. And then to have a grant that supports that work. So that gets that, that final principle is recognizing that we need to be better informed about all of the issues that are impacting our community, especially those new communities that are coming here. Okay. So how do we stay ahead of it? Um, so the, the last thing I want to talk about is the certificate, and Pam can talk about our change project. But for those that are interested in the certificate, um, there is a, um, a flyer in there, and there are two courses that you would be required to take. The first is trauma-informed theory, and the second one is advanced trauma. Advanced trauma being the clinical version of the two. Um, and then students um, work with me to propose a change project in the community. I've had students that have done a variety of change projects. I had one who was working up in the Auburn school system who decided to do uh, a whole training on average type experiences, she showed a movie called Paper Tigers that really addresses ACEs in our high school system <coughs> in Washington. Um, unfortunately, she, um, she um, didn't get to see the entire project implemented. She proposed it, the administration agreed to it, and then she sort of created the training packet and handed it over to the social worker at the, at the middle school. So that's an example of a change project. Um, then I had another student who was working in a medical facility, and she noticed the, just the physical space itself was not trauma-informed. There really weren't pieces of privacy. You'd walk into an exam room. The table with the stirrups was facing the door. Um, so she also created a whole, and she happened to be, uh, she had been the training coordinator for the Department of Corrections uh, for the state of Maine and been doing it for quite some time. So she had some, some really solid training on instructional design. So she created a binder. <laughs> not that I would ever expect students to do that, but she created a binder with PowerPoints and handouts and left it with the, the uh, nurse manager uh, after doing the initial training. They, all, they were all like blown away and they said, we want every one of our medical staff who come on board to receive this training. And we want to constantly sort of be reassessing ourselves on an annual basis. So those are two examples of change projects. Um, Pam, you want to share what your change project, what you're looking at? So my, you know, with my change um, project, I'm partner with another uh, student here, Kendra, and she and I <coughs> will uh, collaborate with the uh, A for, uh, Portland Fire Department and um, also with the, uh, uh, their social worker in trying to establish a uh, support group for the spouses or partners of the firemen. You know, fire uh, fighters they go out and they have support uh, systems and practices in place after they come through a trauma traumatic event, but their spouses or their partners they don't. So what Kendra and I are doing, uh, and along with the rest of the team, is we want to put some systems or some programs or practices in place that support those individuals who may be affected from the trauma victims. So when Pamela approached me last semester, I, 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 I think I cried, actually. <laughs> I can be really emotional about trauma for work. I was so like, oh my god, this is exactly what I wanted to see happen when I came here is to see students be really creative and think about their communities and way to engage with their communities to spread the information. That it's, it's more than just what happens with a client. 
but it's about your organization. It's about your community. It's about other people that we know are impacted by trauma, like our firefighters, our law enforcement officers, you know, who are constantly exposed to traumatic material and the toll that it must take on them. And then to think about their loved ones who really are in some ways kind of forgotten in the whole mix. And not only their loved ones, but their family system, because some of them have children. So thinking about what impact that must be having on a child. Um, and we look back on ACEs, and clearly we want to prevent those ACEs. So if we have an opportunity here to prevent them with, with the partner and with children, uh, what a wonderful example of a trauma-informed change project. Um, so so that's, that's Pamela's. For some students, it's as simple as focusing on their agency and their clients. For others, it might be more of a community focus. Um, and that, in a nutshell, is what the Trauma-Informed Certificate does. It provides you with, with a solid uh, foundation, an opportunity to implement. And some of my students are the first ones to also say, I had a great idea and it really went nowhere. And it was through no fault of their own. It was just because the agency said, great idea, we're just not ready to do it. Okay. But at least they went through the steps of designing and thinking what it would look like. And that's really the goal of the Trauma-Informed Certificate, is to give you that information. Uh, so the last one here is, are we making an impact? Uh, <laughs> I know when I'm doing this stuff by myself, I don't feel it. But when I hear Pamela talking, when I hear those other students you know, talking about, I begin to feel like it's an impact. And I think that's about community. That's about knowing that you're part of a community. So you're not just coming into a program as an individual. I mean, you are as an individual. And you're also part of a community. So we got your back and we're going to work collectively because we know that's how we get the bigger impact is working collectively and sharing. So that's the end. Um, and are there any quick questions? I know we're a little over time, but we started late. So any questions? Any questions from Facebook? I feel so ominous having the bells ringing. <laughs> it's like high like noon or something. I'm going to go outside now. Yes. Well, thank you all for your attention. Unfortunately, I have to um, leave and pick up my son, who's, who's, who's finishing a radio show at WMPG called The Tween Zone. Um, but you do have my contact information there, and you are welcome to reach out to me. Uh, and I'm more than happy to also do a face-to-face -face meeting. I already did one, um, just to sort of answer any questions you may have um, about whether it's a certificate or just about or just about you and in general. So. And Pam, thank you so much. I couldn't have done this without you. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good weekend. Thanks, Sarah. Mm -hmm. We're going to shift the um, the agenda a little bit. Um, Sarah Bedell from uh, Admissions is here, and so she's going to kind of walk you through um, into the uh, application process, and then we're going to come back and talk about the curriculum, uh, field education program, and um, and uh, my colleagues and uh, the panel will be also kind of providing information about that and we'll also have a dialogue about that. So, welcome Sarah. Hello, good morning. Hi, how are you? Good morning. Um, so just, everyone should have um, in their pamphlets this morning the um, application Questions, like I, and I just want to go over a couple of the highlights for you, give you a chance to ask any questions um, if you have them. Our application is fairly straightforward, it's all online. And you'll go in and you'll make an um, account in our online system, and then you'll actually log in and you'll start the application. All the instructions for you are written in there and walks you through step by step. Um, and as you go through the, um, the progress bars, it slowly turn green and turn little green check marks when you're done. And then when everything is a green check mark, then you get to actually submit the application. Um, to submit it, you'll need to uh, include just some general background information, um, where you went to school and your contact information and such, um, a current resume, a professional essay, and then um, two or three references, depending on your, if you're applying for the traditional track or the advanced standing track. And then you just need to um, send us your transcripts from your undergraduate degree. And then once all that stuff is completed, um, you'll, uh, you'll work with me back and forth to try and make sure that all that gets in. And then once that's all done, it goes to the department. Um, and they usually take um, a couple days to a couple weeks to get a decision back, and then we'll go forward from there. And it's fairly straightforward, like I said. Um, 
we usually reach out via email, so make sure that the email address that you put in there is accurate and working. Um, that's how I'll touch base with you most of the time. Um, I usually touch base every couple weeks to give you guys a heads up of where your application is, give you a chance to ask any questions and things like that. And it's usually a fairly straightforward process. Any questions? There's not much. Yeah, and, and obviously this is early in the game. You guys could apply right when you leave from New York City if you want. Um, or you can take time and come back, keep talking with us. And and as Sarah said, her business card is right in here. So if you have questions about the application process, as they come, you can reach out to Sarah about that. The deadline is not until June. We do. Um, suggest people apply earlier in the cycle, um, gives you better options for field placement and gives you mm -hmm. better options for maybe, uh, for maybe uh, qualifying for scholarship funds and stuff like that. So you want to, we recommend that you do this as soon as possible. But you have plenty, it's just open. Yeah. <coughs> I just have one question. Um, if I was to apply for full-time and realize that part-time would work better for mm -hmm. me, is that a difficult thing to switch to? Not. Okay. And you can meet with your advisor and Any other questions? Okay. 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 Moving the field. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. So, we want to, uh, if folks want to get up and stretch or get some food, please feel free to do that. Uh, and the restrooms are downstairs. Um, so basically, um, we want to talk a little bit about the, uh, about the curriculum and about uh, field placement. And um, UNE is the only um, MSW program in the state that has three um, designated concentrations. We have a clinical concentration. We have a community practice concentration, which is working with larger systems. Uh, grant writing, legislative work, uh, community work, um, so that's all in the community practice. And then we have integrated social work practice. And integrated social work practice is taking the best from both, um, from both fields, clinical and community practice. So I don't know if, if um, let me just ask you, how many folks are, are thinking about um, their goal is to uh, get a, a clinical license, the LCSW, down the road? So you have two options. You can do the either the integrated social work practice, um, which allows you in terms of um, getting both the clinical core curriculum, the community practice core curriculum, and then in terms of your field placement, it would be a field placement that has both clinical components and community practice components. So after you graduate, the intermediate level of licensure is a LMSW and you apply for the LMSW. If you're interested in getting a clinical license, um, you apply for the LMSWCC, which is conditional clinical. And with the integrated practice and the clinical um, uh, practice concentration, um, you're set to move forward in terms of getting a clinical license. So the integrated practice um, is something new that we've done. We had it in the past, and then we didn't have it for a while, and students did it informally. And we're constantly looking and reevaluating our curriculum. Is our curriculum current? Is it meeting the needs of population, the current needs in the community, the social work community? Arabella talked about the development of a new course. Uh, in terms of empowerment practice and working with immigrants, refugees, and asylees. That's really pertinent, certainly, in our, in our community. Um, we have another course that uh, Tom McLaughlin, one of our, uh, another one of our faculty, has developed on social work practice with the military and their families. So we're always looking at how do we keep our curriculum current, and we also have an advisory. Um, the School of Social Work has a community social work advisory group that we're always in contact with in terms of, given what's going on in the practice field, what do we need to do different or better in terms of educating our students? So that kind of ongoing dialogue about the program, about the needs of the community, how we constantly kind of tweak uh, and update our curriculum is part of what we're doing all the time. So in terms of the curriculum, um, just to give you a, um, a sense, 
foundation year, um, if you're in the two-year program, and so the options are traditional program, which is two years, full-time, or you can go part-time, do that in three years or four years, or there's advanced standing. So, um, so does anyone have a BSW agree? Nancy, I know you're getting a BSW. Oh, yeah. Yes. So you'll Sorry. By I was like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put you in my arm. <laughs> <laughs> so by, by May of 2018, you'll have your BSW? Yes. Okay. So in Nancy's case, because she has a BSW, um, she could apply for advanced standing, which means that she only needs to come for one year. That only is an option for BSW students. For everyone else, either the two-year program, a part-time program, or we also have an accelerated program. And the accelerated program means that you complete your MSW in 16 months. So let me back up and talk a little bit about what foundation year is like. Foundation year, regardless of what your interests are for a concentration, foundation year is the same. There's certain requirements by the Council on Social Work Education, CSWA. Um, and that there, this is the core curriculum for foundation year. So you're taking human behavior in the social environment in the fall, part one, part two in the spring. You're taking policy, one and two. You're taking practice, one and two. You're taking research, one and two. And you're doing a field placement, and field placement in seminar is considered one course. So you're taking those five courses foundation year. So needless to say, there's no other room for any of the courses uh, foundation year. <coughs> That's your foundation year. Then you choose your concentration for your advanced year. Um, and, um, and then also you're doing another field placement <coughs> excuse me, in your advanced year. So in terms of, um, in terms of the advanced year curriculum, um, we have the core courses for the clinical practice course is a theories course in the fall, and then in the spring course there's a family course. Those are the core courses for the clinical uh, concentration. For the community practice concentration, the two courses are um, administration and supervision and um, program evaluation. <laughs> You're following. Um, and then um, you have a variety of um, elective courses that you can take that either support the clinical uh, concentration or the community practice concentration. And so, and so you might be choosing, um, if you're interested in the advanced trauma certificate, you would be taking the two uh, courses um, required for the advanced trauma certificate and then you would be taking other elective clinical courses or community practice courses to support your concentration. So there's a variety of courses. The dilemma usually is there are more courses that you want to take than you have credits for. So that's, you know, six of one, half dozen of another. Do I take this course or do I take that course because I'm interested in both of them? So in the clinical elective, uh, you have four uh, elective courses you can take. In the uh, community practice elective, you have uh, five oh, elective courses. In the integrated practice, you only have two because you're taking the core courses for both clinical and community practice. So you, you need to choose wisely. I'm going to stop and, and uh, ask uh, Pamela if you want to jump in in terms of uh, the foundation year courses and would it be helpful for folks to get a kind of flavor <coughs> of some of the content of the courses? Yes. Okay. <coughs> you want, you want, I'm sorry, Amy. Just talking a little bit about some of the uh, foundation year courses. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. What, you, what were so, some of the activities were, mm -hmm. that are required? So uh, I really am enjoying because I started out full time. And, it, and elected to go part time, so it was an easy transition over. So I'm still taking it in the same foundation courses. But uh, I took a policy course, which was wonderful. It exposed me to the legislative side of things. Um, we literally got to have mock, uh, legislation within the classroom. So I got to see what it was like to advocate for something I truly believed in. Um, we picked. Uh, we picked up, uh, up uh, something that we wanted to advocate for and we really went through the process of it. We learned how 
uh, policies were made from bottom to top up, and um, it was amazing. So I also took the uh, human um, behavior co course, which consisted of just um, learning about um, the environment, you know, what triggers things, different things in the atmosphere. Um, anything specific that you guys want to know about any of the classes? Uh, speaker, you're talking about elective courses. Was that in the first year? Advanced. Advanced. Okay. Yeah, okay. the first year it's a set curriculum. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you're going to do a lot of group work, papers, of course, but a um, lot of lit literature reviews, um, which really helped me out a lot. Now I can go through them like a dad rabbit. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by literature reviews? Uh, for instance, in your research class, uh, you'll be uh, in the first part, the first semester. You will learn how to um, how to uh, to perform research. Um, I did mine on food nutrition in food pantries, uh, specifically for immigrants that came into our country that didn't know about nutrition, how to cook our foods, how to eat. So I had to go and find a lot of uh, past research on it, uh, literature on past research about that which was li limited and hard to do, but um, that's what I mean by that. And it's also in the other classes as well, um, the literature review. And you literally get to go out the second part of your research class and you have to perform that research project. And that was really informative and um, helpful. And you can be a, um, apply for grants for whatever you believe in or what you believe. You can use your research that you actually did to support uh, trying to find funds for that or to fight for that. How many folks um, are drawn to social work because of research? Because they want to do research? Okay. Okay, good. <laughs> this is usually representative of everyone is sitting there thinking research. I don't know about research. And there's one person who this is really what they're passionate about. <laughs> so let me just say that. Um, we understand that, and so for those who are passionate about research, um, there's lots of opportunities to do some very creative uh, research projects. Um, for folks who are like, no, <laughs> I just need to get through it somehow, some way, um, our faculty is very supportive in terms of helping you identify, helping you learn how to read research, evaluate it, and how to develop a research project that's something that you're passionate about. It's not about learning statistics. It's enough to make anybody's ears spin. It's about, so if you have a particular interest, as uh, Pamela did, and you want to pursue it, that that's the, you get support, and, you know, and, you know, Tom uh, will be sitting down with you and saying, okay, and providing guidance about how to pursue this particular research uh, interest and come up with a project that if you're a full-time student, it may be something connected to your field placement. So it's a benefit both not only to your learning, but a benefit to your field placement as well, because it's something real. It's not just an arbitrary uh, exercise in a research class. So, and I know because that sometimes is a is a, a bit of concern for folks. I know is a concern for me. And uh, a million years ago, when I went to social work school, my assessment skills were pretty good, particularly in my research class of figuring out who were the folks who, like Patrick, you know, were really there and all excited about research, and I was in a cold sweat. And those are the folks, when they put us into small groups for research, I made sure I was in the small group with the folks who were really excited about research, because I thought that peer support was going to carry me through. And it did. I did my part, but it carried me through. Um, so in terms of um, the other uh, pieces of the, of the parts of the curriculum, um, Again, I mentioned there's kind of some of the courses we have um, are administration and supervision. And that's a course that used to just be in the community practice um, concentration. And, um, and then we realized, and certainly when I was advising students, clinical students even, I would say, you know, I know you're a clinical student, and um, there are lots of clinical courses you want to take, but my suggestion is you seriously consider administration and supervision as an elective because um, if you're going for a clinical license, the ink will be dry on your license um, before you are solicited in your agency to move into a supervisory position. So having this course underneath your belt is a good way to go. And then we 
change the curriculum. We change the requirements, and now that's part of the requirements for the uh, clinical uh, practice uh, concentration as well. Um, so there's a, a course on cognitive behavioral therapy. There's a course on narrative therapy. There's a course on social work practice with LGBTQ populations. I teach a course on social work practice uh, and intimate partner violence. Valerie teach teaches course several on, courses. I teach a course on uh, grief and loss. And oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't taught this in a while, but um, social work practice with children, adolescents, and families. And um, let me just say, I did a very poor job of intro introductions, but anyway, let me just say that and Valerie and I are both um, clinical faculty and we're both field faculty. And um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, about field education uh, and what we do at UNE, which is a different perspective and uh, jump in both of you in terms of uh, in terms of our approach. Every school of social work has field uh, component, um, and you'll have two different field placements unless you're advanced standing and they don't have one. So field placement is uh, runs concurrently with the academic year. So you're taking courses while you're in your field placement. Um, and so you do a 20 hour a week field placement typically um, in an agency. So you're there basically two and a half days. And how we roll out the curriculum and the field placement is all your classes predominantly uh, are on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. I think we have one class on, on Wednesday evening. But typically, all the foundation year place the classes meet one time a week. They're all two and a half hours, meet one time a week. Um, and foundation year is all Tuesday and Wednesday classes. And advanced year classes are Wednesday and Thursday. Wednesday is that swing day. And so that leaves Monday, if you're foundation year student, Monday, Thursday, and Friday for your field placement days. Um, so basically, um, during that, during the academic year, um, you're completing 560 hours of your field placement. Um, and the same, you're doing the same amount of hours in the advanced year as well. Now, one of the important things about, um, about field education and about our approach to field education is that you're coming to graduate school. You're adults. Many of you may have worked in a variety of social service areas. Many of you have life experience, businesses, other work that you've done. So you're coming um, to the program with a good understanding of what you want in terms of your education. And in terms of our population of students, we have a very diverse group of students. We have students who come in directly from undergrad. We have students who come back as a second career. Some of the folks who've come back to, um, you know, to uh, seek an MSW, we've had a number of folks who had PhDs in education and came back for an MSW degree. We've had several financial planners who've come back as a second career um, in social work. Uh, we have had uh, Stone Mason who had his own business and found his passion in hospice work. So we have kind of a variety of folks with all different backgrounds. and. When you think about social work, we, we don't have a narrow lens in terms of how we, what kinds of students we're interested in, um, because we're looking at you in a very holistic way in terms of your background, your experience, <coughs> your areas of interest, and what you're passionate about, and what brings you to this profession. Um, so it's not like, oh, if you, we're looking only for folks who have psychology or, or sociology background, not so. So, you know, regardless of what your background is, that's something we're interested in. We have a number of veterans who, who've come back to get their MSW. So we have a kind of a variety and really interesting, uh, diverse um, student body in terms of background, interests, ages. And that makes for a very rich learning environment. So in terms of field, um, we want to make sure you have choices and that we respect that you're coming in with um, a particular interest in a particular field or area. So what we want to do, the first thing that happens when you come in accepted into our program, you get two advisors. 
you get an academic advisor who will meet with you to talk about um, what your long-range goals are, um, what concentrations you're interested in, um, will uh, you can consult with in terms of different courses. If you're interested in the um, advanced trauma certificate, you would be also meeting with Arabella. If you're interested in the arts and social justice certificate, which is another certificate we offer, you'd be meeting with Lori Power. And so, and that certificate looks at using uh, the creative arts to address issues both of, the, of social justice and, and populations you're working with. So you would work with Lori in terms of identifying projects that you would do in order, and as well as a couple of, some courses to get that certificate. Both certificates do not require extra coursework. It's not extra money, it's bonus added. If you're interested in either of those, it's something that you would just meet either with Arabella or with uh, Lori to try and figure out, um, you know, what, what courses you need. So, um, so in terms of field planning, so um, there are three of us who in the uh, field education uh, program, and so Kelly Fox is the director, then myself, and Valerie. And so the three of us, you'll, one of our names will show up on your acceptance <laughs> letter. And so, and in the letter it'll say, you know, um, you know, welcome to the School of Social Work, and here's the name of your academic advisor, and here's the name of your field advisor, and contact, if you're a full-time student, contact them immediately. What will sometimes happen is, uh, before you get that letter, some of us, like myself, gets a little bit proactive on things, and you might get an email from me saying, congratulations, welcome to the School of Social Work, I'm your field advisor, when can we meet? Um, and the reason we do that is um, placements are competitive. And so, um, as Sarah mentioned, the sooner you apply, the sooner we meet with you, and the sooner we start working on getting you a field placement. And that's our priority. So what we want to do in that field planning meeting is, my interest is, I want to get a sense of who you are as a person. What brought you to social work? What are you passionate about? What directions do you see you're going in? And what are you bringing in terms of work experience related to social services in some very broadly defined way? Uh, other activities you've been involved with on uh, across the spectrum, you might have been involved in your political activities, social justice activities. So what are you bringing and what do you, what do you want in terms of the field placement? And so we'll talk about um, based on your interests, here are some suggestions of agencies you might be interested in, in looking at. We have a huge resource book and we're always adding agencies. We're ad adding agencies um, ourselves in terms of looking into the community and finding new agencies that are good learning opportunities for our students. We hear from students talking about identifying an agency that they're interested in and bringing that to me and then we take it the next step. So it's a constant kind of expanding uh, possible agency opportunities for you. And so then we'll talk about, you, you choose four agencies. We talk about the A list and the B list, your top two choices of agencies, and your third and fourth choice. So we start off with, we do the front work. You choose the agencies, and Kelly, Valerie, and I are the ones who reach out to your top two choices. Um, the three of us are liaison to all the agencies in the resource book. Um, if you're meeting with me, I might be the liaison to the agencies you chose, or I might have, have no contact with the agencies, and Valerie might be the liaison. Whoever the liaison is, we do the front work, we reach out to the agency, send your resume, let them know you're interested, and ideally what we like to hear is, you know, fine, um, you know, send John, yeah, we'd like to interview John let him know that given my contact information. We get you the interview and then the rest is in your hands in terms of going on the interview. Um, we, you know, kind of give you helpful hints and suggestions. We have a field placement packet of um, how to prepare for the interview, things you might want to do, questions you might want to be prepared to ask or to answer. Um, so you go on the interview, but we ask you, so you have this first interview and you think, I found my ideal field placement but we encourage you to go on too. We don't want you to lose the first opportunity if it's your first choice. But what we found over time is 
doing some comparative shopping really is best because the second interview might be your second choice, but you really feel like you clicked with the field instructor. The field instructor is the agency supervisor who's going to be working with you and supervising your field placement. That, that relationship is critical in terms of your learning. And so if you go on to interviews, you're doing some comparison about what are the learning opportunities, um, is, this, is this a good fit for me in terms of the agency, how do I feel about the field instructor, um, and is this a good fit for me. So suppose you go on to interviews and you may get offers and you may decide, no, maybe this is not exactly what I want to do, but let's go down to my third and fourth choice. So we have those choices so we keep the process moving forward so that um, it's not like, okay, we have to meet again, we have to figure out a time around your classes, we have the information to move forward. During that time, and um, uh, uh, a problem I wish for <coughs> all the students I work with is you get two offers and it's like, I don't know which one they're taking. I really, you know, I like this one, I like that one, and so, you know, let's, you know, tease it out, or can I be a sounding board? <coughs> but that's, that's the problem I wish for everybody, um, that they have two good choices and it's hard to make a decision. Um, but our, so that we do the front work, uh, but you make the decision in terms of both the agencies you um, select and in terms of uh, your final choice. I'm going to stop and be quiet. I'm doing my former New Yorker thing. I'm talking faster and faster. Um, and so I'm going to stop and ask Valerie um, anything to jump into it in terms of the field planning process or anything <coughs> of it. Um, I don't think so. I, I do want to emphasize that, as Amy said, the placements can be competitive with certain types <coughs> of placements um, that tend to garner more interest than others. So the sooner you start the process, the better. Um, we start meeting with students as soon as our holiday break is over. So January 2nd, we hit the ground running with, um, with students coming in to work with us. Um, so that's important. It's important while we do the front work, it's important to um, keep the communication flowing so that if we reach out to you saying this has happened, they want to interview you, that you jump right on it. Um, but it can be a fairly seamless process as long as everybody stays in communication and does things in a timely manner. Helen, do you want to jump in in terms of any part of the kind of field planning process or interview process or anything that, you know, anything that I can share? First, I wanted to reiterate, don't. Um, there is a deadline posted, and I'll go from personal experience. I'm not a procrastinator, but in that particular instance, I did. And um, I got it in before the deadline, but that year they had an overwhelming amount of uh, people to be accepted. And so the field placement slots, like Amy was saying, were gone. They were gone. But they were still willing to work with me and everything. So sooner the better is, sooner you get your application, then the better. Also, um, I, uh, like you, Nancy, I love working um, with the immigrants that come in and in vulnerable populations. So I went and found a place that I wanted to go to. And, um, and I had to, you know, it had to meet our, our competencies and I had to fight for it in my own way, but in a good way, a good fight with Amy. And I uh, got that and I'm very happy about that. So uh, the interviewing process. Please make sure that you, um, you'll you get a resume from from Amy or from Valerie. Please make sure that you format your your resume, that your personal resume into that format matching because the the, peop the agencies are used to that and they'll look it over and it's simpler for them and they know exactly what they're looking for. And Amy always sends out a, um, a template of that to you so you don't have to worry about that piece. The process interviewing, I literally had an opportunity to interview with Valerie when she worked at the, uh, the Center for Grieving Children. Um, she called me in and we had a, a it was really um, formal but yet informal. It's just conversing back and forth like we're doing now and um, they just want to know 
why you are interested in working and what you feel that the agency can impart to you and what can you give back to the agency and you know why are you passionate about being there so honestly I feel it's the best they'll ask you questions about you know what do you feel about doing these particular duties or, or learning this or this and if you're not uh, interested in it be honest with them because you want to be happy where you have to spend the next year of your life you know you want to feel attached and engaged and I want to talk about your uh, the social worker that will be on site with you um, I have had I have a wonderful one I've been blessed throughout this whole process uh, you and me is just a great place I know I sound like a cheerleader for it but I am I have not had a bad experience here or if I had something bad happen, uh, been able to sit and talk and just get it fixed. But back to the social work on, that you'll work with, it's imperative that you uh, develop a good relationship or have a good fit with that person. And if you have any issues or any uh, concerns, I'll say, it's, please don't feel like you can't come back and talk to your, to your, uh, to Amy or Valerie or to whomever you're assigned to because. They're very open. They realize that uh, sometimes things just don't fit, or sometimes things just don't work, or sometimes we just need to relook at things at a different angle. And they'll sit down and they'll talk to you, and they'll they'll want to hear your <coughs> perspective, and then they'll give you input back. And then solutions are always come. I've always been able to come up with solutions, although I haven't had that many problems. But <laughs> just saying, you know. And I'd like to point out. So I'm. Some of you I've met. Um, I work in, as staff in the yeah. School of Social Work and do a lot of stuff with the recruitment side of things. And so part of what I try to learn too is what is unique about our program and what other programs are or are not doing. And I will say that our field placement program, from what I hear from incoming students and students that have gone through a program and have experienced other programs, it's very unique in that way that we really do work with you to, to place you in the right fit. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of places that just have like, okay, this is what we have, take your pick. But as Amy said, and Valerie and Pam has pointed out, if you have an idea or you have strong interests, we have a wide range, like 300 or more possible placements for you throughout the community and so I just want to point out that that's a huge strength of our program here. You know, the other thing I want to just mention is that um, many of the field instructors who are the community social workers, either working in agencies or some might be in private practice at this point or whatever, but many of our field instructors who are supervising our students are alums of our program. Mm -hmm. They know the faculty. They know the mission and vision of the of the of the program. Um, they're familiar with the curriculum, and so um, I mean, it, and so so. It, and they're very much looking forward to supervising the next you know the next cohort of social workers, and um, we have. Um, we offer uh, field instructors and on-site supervisors, and the difference is, uh, for example, there are some agencies that provide uh, excellent social work opportunities, but they don't have an MSW on-site. They don't, in the program, they don't employ an MSW. In cases like that, we look at what the agency services are, does it meet the competencies for the Council on Social Work Education requirements, if it does, we will find an off-site field instructor, which is a community social worker, in some cases an alum of our program, who has the experience uh, that related to the uh, services provided by that agency. And so we will set you up with an interview. So you meet with this off-site social worker. It's a mutual interview. You know, you're interviewing them to see is this a good fit. They're interviewing you to see if this is a good fit in terms of providing supervision. And so in that particular case, you have an agency staff person who's your on-site supervisor, the go-to person for orientation, daily activities, and provide supervision. And then your field instructor who's off-site, who's providing the hour required by CSWA. Um, and, it, you know, and again, that means coordination between the agency staff person, the off-site field instructor, and the, and the uh, 
on you know on site supervisor, but it can, and it can work well. Um, so and in fact, that's what you know that's what Pamela has this particular uh, for her foundation here. Um, so just because there is an director doesn't mean that you know the agency is never a possibility. So we're open to that. Um, so the course that goes along with your internship is uh, your field seminar and it meets weekly um, and the, the main purpose of seminar is for you to have a safe place to talk about what is going on for you in your field placement. Um, you know, what's going well, what might be challenging, and it can be really helpful, like Arabella and Pamela were talking about the peer support. Um, that's an excellent opportunity to get some peer support around what you're going through. It can be very beneficial to hear that you're not the only one that is having um, a particular struggle in your internship um, and it's also great to hear other people's successes as well and so within that seminar your seminar instructor um, is kind of your home base person between your field placement and the school so um, if there's a concern your field and you can tell your field seminar person and they will reach out to the agency um, on your behalf. That's after you've addressed the issue yourself. Um, but twice during your placement, once each semester, we will make an appointment to come sit and visit with you, um, your field instructor, um, and ourselves to see how things are going. We like to do it between the sixth and the tenth week in the first semester. So if there's things that need to be addressed, we can get to it right away. Um, we can also answer any questions that they might have um, regarding you know, maybe your learning contract, what they should be providing to you, um, and also answer questions that you might have. Um, are there you know, am I allowed to do this certain activity? Um, can I incorporate what I'm doing my research project on into my internship? So the field visit gives us an excellent opportunity to also see you in that environment. Um, and it helps give us a, a better understanding of what is going on. Even if we visited that um, agency before, you're a different person than the intern that had been there last year. So it gives us an opportunity to see how it's helpful to you. Um, during uh, the seminar, while most of it is around checking in on how things are going, uh, we also try to <coughs> integrate some different topics. So we might talk about ethics, we might talk about um, use of self or self-disclosure in the work that you're doing. Um, we talk about safety. We have people from um, DHHS come in and talk about child protective services and adult protective services. So it's kind of an all-around um, informational and support class that goes along with your internship and it's designed to really help you have a successful um, experience and always feel that somebody has your back and that you're not out there in the community by yourself. Question. Yeah. Yeah, this is a lot of information. It is a lot of information. <laughs> <laughs> there is a lot of information on a Saturday morning. Um, <laughs> just to review a little bit. Uh, the first year you said cluster two, six, Wednesday. And is there a um, specific time that those were going to happen? Okay. Uh, cluster started nine on Tuesdays, like it's, it, um, well, on Tuesdays, for example, there are two time slots for seminars, 9.30 to 11.20. Um, seminar classes are two hours. The other classes are two and a half hours. So we have two slots for um, seminar, 9.30 to 11.20 and 3.30 to 5.20. 
then there are other courses that are offered throughout the day. So I think the latest course we have this particular semester ends at 8 o'clock in the evening. Mm -hmm. So, and then Wednesdays, um, classes I believe start at 9, like at 11.30, then we have 12.30 or 1, 2, whatever. So, um, so it goes through both days. Um, I think, I guess the more specific question would be, um, if someone was to have, wanted to, needed to keep their 9 to 5 job, Right. Would you suggest part time is the only way to go? Yeah, if you have a full time job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Now, in terms of courses, we have obviously the traditional face to face course. Mm -hmm. We also have something called the hybrid course. Have folk, have any, all, some of you taken uh, online courses on Blackboard using Blackboard as a format? Mm -hmm. Some of you have. Okay, that's what we use as Blackboard. The hybrid courses, um, at a report, all our semesters are 14 weeks. And so at a 14 week semester, it means you only come to campus six times. Mm -hmm. So the first two classes are face to face in a hybrid class. And then the next, every, then you're two weeks online, the third class you come in, and that's how it goes. And the last class is uh, face to face. You only come to campus six times. Now, in terms of, um, Typically, we have like one class for each section for foundation year, each required class, hybrid, um, advanced year, it, it depends. Um, but, um, but that is a possibility to do a mix of hybrid and face-to-face -face courses. For some folks, hy you know, hybrid uh, it works really well with their learning model. For other students, it's like, I really need face-to-face, -face, or I really want face-to-face, -face, but you can do <coughs> courses. Have you done a mix of courses, or all face-to-face? -face? I've done one kind. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. yeah. With the advanced standing, I'm like trying to understand this. That chart, <laughs> right. So I've been like looking at it the whole time, and I just, if you could break this down for me, that sure. would be great. <laughs> um, do we, like, advanced, do they still have, do we still have a seminar? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You have, so. you have, a, you have a field placement for the academic year and a seminar course okay. in the academic year. And then uh, you would be, depending on the concentration, you would be choosing courses um, that are required for your concentration as well as uh, elective courses. Okay. Yeah. But you would do that in, in one year. For advanced standing, um, you don't start in September. You take what's called a, a, a bridge course. It's a, a course that um, is like an introductory course before you start advanced year, and that's offered the uh, last two weeks of August. And then you start the, in the fall semester. Um, so it's a way of um, kind of integrating um, kind of an introductory to the advanced year, um, advanced year curriculum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that course is one week face to face and one week online, and then you start your advanced year courses. Yeah, it helps if you think of your BSW as just that's your foundational year. Oh yes, they, so they told us about that. that so, yeah. and then you come mm -hmm. in like you're in your second yeah. year and just stream on it. If I do the part time, how long does that take? You you can do it in uh, two years. Okay. If you do it part time, what uh, typically what students do is the first year they do their coursework. Okay. Some of their half of their coursework, and the second year they do their field placement and some of their coursework they split it. That okay. Way. Yeah. That's the better. The thing actually. I want to <laughs> add is that we we have an accelerated program. I mentioned it in terms of sixteen months. Because we have an accelerated program, what that means is. Everyone who's accelerated still does the traditional two-semester foundation year. You finish your foundation year the end of April, first week of May. <coughs> For accelerated students, instead of starting their advanced year in September, you start your advanced year in the middle of May. And so the summer session is your similar in terms of course offerings and field placement beginning. It happens in the summer. And then uh, the fall semester is your spring semester, basically, and you graduate in December. So because we offer a full complement of advanced year courses starting in the summer, for those who are traditional two-year students, but you want to cut down on your, the amount of coursework you have in the fall and spring semester, you can begin to take advanced courses in the summer session. And for students who are clinical students, um, 
some clinical placements, advanced year clinical placements, will want you to have taken um, coursework on the DSM, or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Illnesses. Um, they want you to have that coursework done before you come into an advanced year clinical placement. You could take that one course in the summer session, easy enough. Um, so that we do have both a variety of ways we push out the curriculum in terms of trying to make it um, kind of flexible for folks who are working full time and families have other responsibilities. Um, other questions? Yeah. Um, as far as field placements go, mm -hmm. is it at all possible to have a field placement that's paid? Great question. I would like to see, we have lots of paid field placements, but that would be misrepresented. We do, I mean, there are agencies who offer stipend for students. Mm -hmm. um, the VA, uh, students who do an advanced year field placement at the VA, um, you get a stipend, uh, a student stipend. Community care, um, which provides, um, which does HCT work, home community treatment. Um, and what that is is, um, the services they provide, if, um, if either Department of uh, Health and Human Services has identified a potential issue, they've gotten a report on uh, suspected child abuse or neglect, and so DHHS goes in, um, does an investigation, and they find there's, a not, there's not enough information to warrant opening a Children's Protective Services case but the family could do some supports. So they would contract out uh, to an agency like Community Care or Providence. And uh, the, the approach that HCT work is that there's a, a licensed social worker and a, a behavioral health professional, BHP, who go in as a team. The, the clinician does the family assessment. They come up with a treatment plan for the, for the kiddo in the family. Uh, and working with the parents or guardians. And so, um, and the students start in the role of BHP for the first semester of their advanced year, and then in the second semester, they move more into the clinician role. So it's a fabulous, you know, amazing experience in terms of social work practice. They offer stipend. Sorry, um, I was trying to listen and also think about something. You were saying, sure. what was the BHP group? Uh, it, it, it's a, it's a title for folks doing uh, home and community treatment work. So community care um, offers stipends. Um, there are, I'm trying to think in terms of other agencies that offer stipends. Um, sometimes if you're employed in an agency, and uh, in a social service agency, and you're going back to school, they will cover the cost, uh, they might cover the cost of a course or two, or provide a stipend. It really depends on the agency, and that's something that we're, you know, constantly trying to get more information about um, in terms of, um, you know, trying to find opportunities for students where there is some stipend. So there's some folks who do something called a place of employment, field placement. Now, what that means is you're employed in a social service agency. Maybe you're doing case management. Um, the agency is large enough for you to do a field placement in a different <coughs> part of the agency. The Council on Social Work Education is very strict about what they will, uh, what they will um, recognize as a field placement. If you've worked as a case manager in Agency X, you cannot do a field placement doing the same activities in Agency X as what you're being paid for because the question will be, where's the new learning? So if you're in a, a large agency that has multiple programs and your agency says, we want to keep you as, a, as an employee and we're willing to, to continue to pay for you or to pay you, you could do an internship in a different program, but you have a field instructor, your supervisor is not your employment supervisor, it's somebody different who's just concerned in protecting your internship and you're not being evaluated as an employee in doing these new activities. You're there designated as an intern. Because we want to make sure that your internship is protected. So as an employee, you have certain, re you still have your certain responsibilities as an employee. 
um, as an intern, you're there in a learning position, and we want to make sure that the, both your the agency protects that learning piece of um, of your work there, and that is not evaluating you as an employee. That's really important because we don't want you to feel like you know your employment responsibilities and your internship responsibilities, and each one has a leg and is pulling in opposite directions because that makes for no good learning. It makes for a pretty horrific experience, which is the last thing we want you to have. Other things? How much is tuition for the year? <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry, Sarah isn't here. Um, <laughs> trying to think, uh, do you know what it is per credit? Um, I think it's 800 hey. per credit hour. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, and then, again, yeah, and then there's like we said, we have rolling admissions, so there's scholarship opportunities. The earlier, the better. There's financial aid. And something we haven't talked about yet, which is kind of a big deal, is we just got a grant recently um, for when you go into your advanced year, if you're doing work with behavioral health, with diverse, primarily an older, older population, yeah. but I think it also yeah. might include some Underserved populations. Underserved populations in rural areas, which is a lot of Maine. Um, and those are $10,000 stipends. So Connected to your field placement. Right. And I think we are able to give like 20. 22 the first 22 year. 22 the first year. So yeah. this is a pretty big deal. We just yeah. got this. So keep that on your radar. Um, there's also lots of like federal loan repayment grants if you know you're going to go into the social services or anything like that. Um, so, and again, those are things that financial aid, office, yeah. Sarah Bedell can talk with you about. Right. But really important is that we do have scholarship money. It is limited. It's not as much as we would like. But if you apply early, you apply for the scholarship money early, and you have a much better chance of getting it. Um, and, and then in addition to that, there's this new triad um, grant, which we just heard this past week, that it's a federal grant, it's a training grant for social workers, and the focus of the grant is working with um, rural populations, high need, medically underserved, and so the areas are the county, but Oxford County and parts of uh, York County. Um, meet the federal qualifications for underserved. It it's <coughs> focusing on older adults um, as well as the LGBTQ community in terms of the older population. So if you have a passion in that direction, um, this would be a good, um, you know, this would be a good um, uh, grant, you know, good uh, grant to apply for. And we'll have a process. This is the third federal grant we've gotten over the last six years. So we, we have, uh, so that's something we're very excited about because we know UN is costly, uh, which is very frustrating to faculty. <coughs> and so we want to look at, you know, what are the other resources for folks? Yeah. So three related questions. <coughs> um, you just mentioned 22, $10,000 stipends, depending on <coughs> your field place. And that, is, is that only advanced year? Or only advanced okay, yeah, year. So further early, so what? How many applicants to the foundation year? <coughs> how many are uh, accepted, and how big is the class? It depends uh, because <coughs> our <coughs> our campus program between full time, part time, accelerated. We look at all of them. It's anywhere between eighty and one hundred twenty students, maybe roughly. Sure. Mm -hmm. So. Um, because we have rolling admissions, uh, which means that when we get an application, we don't wait till sometime in the spring and then sit down and review them all. Mm -hmm. When we get the application, as soon as Sarah and the admissions office um, pulls together all the pieces of the application, which is the application that you fill out online, then you're doing a professional statement, and the professional statement that you're writing is an essay and you're writing it based on, you're answering three questions. And the three questions are directly related to, um, to the mission and vision statement um, that we're asking about why social work, basically. Um, and so you write that essay, 
And then you send your transcripts and the two recommendations. In the case of advanced standing, you're and also having a, a recommendation from either your field director at you know mm -hmm. USM or your field instructor, as well as your field um, evaluations. Okay. Uh, and that once we have all the pieces together and we get that uh, we get that um, application, we review it. We review it immediately. It doesn't take weeks. It takes. Uh, it hits the floor, and Meg and Bob are uh, two of our uh, staff who are get that to us, and we review it and we get back to you right away. Um, if you're a good candidate, we want to make sure um, that we admit you to the program. So we move very quickly on that. What's the percentage? If what percentage do we accept? Yeah. You know that's hard to say. It depends. It, it depends on the applicants, and uh, you know it really it it really does. Um, and we're we're evaluating um, your statement. We're evaluating your experience. Um, uh, so we're we're. It's not just oh everyone with the 4.0 comes. And lots of people with 4.0s. I mean, terrible social workers. Mm -hmm. um, so if we're not. It's not all about grades. Our grades important. Yeah. What's different about this program is. How many of you, for your undergraduate program, had it was a lot of tests? You experienced a lot of tests. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. This is all about um, learning. This is all about um, writing. So, and, in terms of what we're looking at, is folks that can um, become critical thinkers, uh, can enhance their critical thinking skills, that can are are your react. We're asking you to react to articles. Uh, to evaluate things, to look at what are the theories you're learning, how you apply them to practice. We're looking at developing self-reflexive practitioners in terms of what we bring as social workers to the to the field, to the work that we're doing. It's not about tests. I don't think there's any tests. Are there even tests in research? There's not one test that you're going to take. Um, so it's all about it's all about um, that writing, that dialogue, the conversations in class. Uh, case-based learning in terms of looking at particular uh, cases and, and um, approaching it from different directions. And I forgot all about IPEC. So we, the other opportunity we have on this campus is um, IPEC, was, which is the Interprofessional uh, Educational Collaborative. We have a very rich uh, campus that has all sorts of um, every possible health profession. We have physical therapy, we have occupational therapy, we have dental hygiene, we have the dental school, we have the school of pharmacy, um, we have um, uh, the PA program, physician assistant program, we have nursing, um, we have the dental school. The only health profession not on this campus is the DO school, um, which is on the Biddeford campus. And so on a regular, on a weekly basis, um, well, probably now monthly, we have um, workshops on Wednesdays between 12 and 1.30. There are no classes during that time on the Westbrook College campus. And so we have workshops on various aspects of interprofessional uh, education. And as, as social workers, when we go into different fields of practice, we will be collaborating with other health professions. So what is our role as a social worker collaborating with a other health profession? What is it that we bring that's unique about our profession? And how do we learn to collaborate with docs, with nurses, with PAs, with PT uh, folks? And there are different opportunities that are open to you, both in attending workshops and in getting involved in specific projects so that you and other students from the other professions are working together around a particular case. So that's just added on opportunities. You can go for a certificate uh, as well, which indicates you've been engaged in various interprofessional opportunities. And that's just an add-on. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? And I know it's late, but I want to come so back to I can just say my empty, which is a yeah. part of the IPEC, and um, got with the other healthcare professionals on here. We met, as Amy said, on Wednesday. And we literally did a simulation of, uh, as if we were in the in the work field, working say together with the professions, we had a uh, actors that come in. Um, they go in a room, and you sit literally like this. If you're not there, and your teammates that are going in, i.e., the social worker and the rest of the professionals, the dentist, the OT, go in and they talk to the patient. They find out the needs of the patient. As a group, they sit there, 
and find out the patient needs and then they come back and we sit as a group of professionals and we design a, a care plan for that patient. And you get to do that uh, three times and it was really beneficial because I knew nothing about pharmacy, how pharmacy integrated into the social work or you know all the other professions and you learn their terminology and their, their piece and I'm also learning now from my sister who's been in the social work field for 30 years that this is how it is working in hospitals, in in um, any other clinical set, settings uh, where patients are. This is how the, they're transitioning over to this type of workforce. So it was, um, and it's interesting too. Love. I'm gonna piggyback on that and say I highly recommend getting involved in interprofessional mm -hmm. opportunities here. I think it's a signature of UNE. Yes. I also do videography on the side and I just did a video for IPEC. Mm -hmm. So I got to interview all kinds of students, a medical um, physician in the field who said like this is like one of the reasons they take uh, UNE students is because of our background in interprofessional education and almost every student used the phrase their aha moment <laughs> which yeah. was through something that was an IPEC opportunity where the, the veil was sort of lifted and almost every student talked about working with social workers mm -hmm. and how that was like the number one profession and OTs because <laughs> a lot of people are like what's an OT? Mm -hmm. But social workers where they were like wow I never knew that that's what social workers did. So it's a great mm -hmm. opportunity for you guys also to kind of share what you do with people. Um, yeah. Okay so I guess we're kind of running out of time so I'll be quick. Um, I just wanted to um, go over the folders really quickly and let you guys know this is early in the game I know and this is a lot of information so that's why I'm here um, I work in the staff upstairs Meg Webster you guys probably got an email from me um, for signing up for this event and my business card is right inside these folders so if you have any sort of questions or you want to come sit in on a class or get a copy of a schedule from me so you can kind of get an idea of oh what courses are offered for electives um, if there's a specific faculty member that you're interested in connecting with that can all be channeled through me um, and then what's inside is just more information about our program the certificate programs information about those are inside um, and I just want to stress what a wide range I mean, an MSW is so versatile. I'm not a social worker, but I've kind of learned a lot about the profession just through having this job. And one of the things I'll say about this profession is it is just, you can do so many things with it. So today you saw Arabella speak, but it could have been um, Tom on research or someone who does a lot of community practice. Um, do you have time? There's a four minute video here that's about a student's field placement. Um, is anyone here interested in community practice at all? Or is everybody more like clinical? Maybe a little bit. Some? Okay, so this is a four minutes and then I say we close. But it just gives you kind of a taste of what the field placement experience is like and some insight into other opportunities that you can have here at. It's Katie. Katie, she's an advanced student here in the program. This was her foundation year field placement at Preble Street. Meetings, and we had a media person who was working with us. And it's important, it's like, the, as, as you notice, there's a person with a wheelchair. And if we can't watch it, then <laughs> you yeah. can go to our website. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
May I ask a question while we're waiting? Sure. I came here today explicitly to, to compare USM and UNE. And I'm before the other individuals leave who I know someone is at, in the bachelor program for, for the social work and others from the U University of Maine system. Just, just your impressions of the difference between the master's program for USM, MSW at USM, and MSW at UNE. I'm going to a um, open house on Monday at USM. I don't know if, I you, if you know about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess I'm going to compare, that time. compare things at that point. I'm also looking at the um, master's for counseling mm -hmm. and school counseling. So I'm trying to also weigh out my options between those two. Yeah. It's kind of, um, I'm either going to go with and we had a media person who was working with us. Sorry. That's okay. Um, I'm in USM for the bachelor's now. Um, for me, I've been at USM for a couple years, and there was an incident I had dealt with, uh, with my field placement, actually. And I feel like I did not get enough backbone from them. And I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be... The bad person here. No, no, I, no. <laughs> um, so the only person that like advocated for me was my advisor, and I felt like I feel like I needed more support, and I didn't get it from them. So I'm not gonna go to their master program. Well, I know that. Time yeah. yeah, I'm not gonna go there. That's why I'm here. Yeah. Like weighing my options and seeing, um, and I feel like this might be a better fit for me. But that's just for me. Sure. Sure. And, and, and it's important, it's like, the, as, as you notice, there's a person with a wheelchair, and, and, and one of the things I'm involved with, I'm, involved, I'm on the Portland Disability Committee, not that I'm disabled, but, but a lot of people at the shelter are disabled, and so they definitely need help, you know. I sort of feel like, what haven't I learned at my placement this year? <laughs> um, I've learned so much. I've learned, I've learned about um, the real struggles of um, being homeless. You know, I had all kinds of ideas. And um, because it is such a wide range of clientele, um, and, you know, the whole gamut in terms of why they are there, the truth is, it, from my experience, social work is really all about relationship. And you can read about how to do that from now until forever. But until you're actually sitting with someone, making eye contact, or attempting to make eye contact, and attempting to engage the relationship, um, you don't learn your skills. You don't know what you're good at. You don't know what you have to learn. I came to this program with this real appreciation for stories and for people's narratives, um, but I have learned so much about the, the way people put together their own personal story and their own narrative and how important that is. One of the best parts of the experiences is watching students evolve, kind of come into this environment most often with very little experience with this particular subculture, this vast array of communities that we engage. To be able to be in class, to learn specifically about you know, a challenge that happens when you're trying to do clinical work with people, and then go directly to the homeless shelter the next day and try and apply it. And sometimes it would work, and sometimes it wouldn't really work, but then being able to go back to class the next week and get the feedback immediately. So it felt like this process that was really helpful in terms of growth in both spaces. I want them um, to come away with a sense of confidence and awareness of their own biases and judgments. I want students to come away with an understanding of poverty in America. You know, theories are really important, but when you are trying to apply them in the moment, is when you realize how much you have to bring to that in terms of the theory working. The social safety net has huge 
huge holes in it. And it's real people that fall through those holes. Um, and the relationships that people develop with our clients are meaningful um, and literally change people's lives. Kitchen. You know, today I'm, I, I have an apartment. You know, I, I can pretty much, I'm pretty self-sufficient, so I don't have a need of services, but I, I, I enjoy, or I feel purposeful working to advocate for people that are not as fortunate as me, if that makes any sense. If everyone could fill out this and leave it with us here, that would be really great. And yeah, and as Meg said, if you want to sit in on a class or you want to talk more with any one of the faculty, just contact Meg and we're happy to do that. <laughs>